if you're thinking of ERP projects, one of the decisions that you have to make is whether to include the selection process and you don't know what you are going to get out of the process. So which are the deliverables that you need to have? And those are the deliverables that we are going to discuss in this video. So let's dive in. everyone, my name is Sam Gupta. I am principal at Elevate IQ. Elevate IQ is the independent ERP and digital transformation consulting firm. We help our clients with ERP selection, digital transformation strategy, ERP implementation. On that note, let's get back to today's topic, which is going to be different deliverables uh, that you should be expecting if you are going for the ERP selection process. So before that, let's talk about different selection methods that we have in the market. There are going to be many different approaches that companies take depending upon their expertise, depending upon uh, the investment made. And that's why the whole selection process could come across as very confusing. So that's why these deliverables are going to help you understand how to structure your process. So now let's look at the list. <music> Number one on our list is project and implementation charter. And sometimes when people start with the implementation process, they might not feel that they need to have any sort of formal uh, charter uh, in place. And the reason why this matters is because when you are going to get into the nuances of the selection, everybody is going to have their own sort of preferences in terms of what they are looking for in a system so when selecting one of the features how it is going to impact the other areas and that's where the agreeing on the project charter helps so some of the components that are going to be really relevant from the project charter perspective is going to be number one define your objectives and even if you're looking at defining the objectives you need to be very specific some of the examples could be sometimes they are going to say you know what i am looking for an erp because I am outgrowing my current ERP or the current ERP is not working or I am having business issues with it or I am not able to measure the inventory. So these are going to be my objectives. For example, improve inventory or improve the experience of the users from the system. Now, the problem with these objectives is that it does not pass the SMART criteria. And when I look at SMART, that's going to be S stands for specific, M is measurable, E stands for achievable, R is realistic, and T is timely. So each of the objectives that you are going to capture, make sure it passes the criteria of SMART. And when you say, let's say inventory needs to be improved, inventory needs to be improved by how much? What is the current KPI that you are uh, measuring? So you need to be really, really smart in capturing these objectives. If you have that, it's going to be much easier when you are going to build the consensus among teams or if you are simply looking for the critical success factors that are going to be relevant when you are conducting the demo or talking to the vendors. So make sure your objectives are going to be specific. The definition of success is going to be super critical as well as part of your implementation charter. And typically that comes from some sort of KPIs. Now, if you don't know or if you don't have a way to measure KPIs, in your current processes, that could be one objective that you need to be able to measure these KPIs. But if you have some way of measuring the results, then it becomes much easier conversation when you are going to get into these arguments where everybody's sort of pulling the architecture in their direction. They all want different systems in the architecture. They might have different expectations from the system. So aligning and documenting this in the form of charter really helps. Now, the other things that are super critical from the implementation charter perspective is, you know, some of the risks or budget or the scope. And again, that sort of sets the tone for the project. So make sure you guys document the project charter. This is super critical. You don't have to spend a lot of time, but you have to have something documented. And by the way, 
uh, even if you formalize something that does not mean that the, you cannot make changes to it that's going to be evolving process but once you actually put down in the form of documentation then you can always go back compare and then see okay do you need to make changes in your charter or do you you need to make changes to your expectations and the whole process is going to help you aligning the expectations of all the users. So that's number one. Now, number two on our list is a stakeholder matrix. And this is super critical as well. Sometimes most companies miss this particular step or the deliverable. They don't really have formal documentation of how stakeholders are aligned, who is going to be making decisions when, and the output of a stakeholders matrix is going to be, okay, how you are going to structure your communication plan because this is where you are identifying all of your subsidiaries, you are identifying all of different roles in terms of who's going to be responsible, who's going to be doing the actual work, who is going to be making decisions for each of the process area. And sometimes the users might not speak up just because they might not feel comfortable in front of executives. So then you might have challenges in incorporating the user voice. And if those concerns are not really addressed, then you are going to find surprises later in the project. So when you look at the stakeholder metrics, you are looking at the whole subsidiary mapping in terms of how many ever different divisions uh, or sites you might have. You need to identify point of contact for each of those subsidiaries and then you are looking at different roles such as your subject matter experts, the business process owners, all of those need to be identified as part of the stakeholder matrix. Then you are going to have issues such as, let's say during the project, you have people who might not be cooperating. So you need to identify the escalation authority as well in terms of, let's say, if you are not getting something done as part of the project, okay, who do you go to uh, to resolve those concerns? As part of this analysis, you are also going to identify the communication plan in terms of who is going to be part of your core team, who is going to be part of your steering committee. So if you document this, it's going to become much easier in identifying these parties, in facilitating the meetings and in facilitating the decisions as well. So that's number two. Now, number three on our list is the requirements matrix or the business process documentation or the business requirement documentation. Number one, when you are going to capture any sort of requirements that you need to remember is even these requirements need to pass the SMART criteria. And if they don't pass the SMART criteria, for the most part, they are probably not going to be implementable. They are not going to be executable. And if you follow the SMART framework, and the SMART framework is going to test your critical reasoning skills that you are not making any sort of assumptions when you are capturing these requirements. So as part of the requirement metrics, number one, what you're looking for is you are identifying each of the business uh, function and then sub function of that and then you are identifying different requirements that you need to capture in most cases with ERP systems regardless of whether you are going to be a small company or large company you are probably going to be looking at roughly 300 to 400 requirements that you need to capture and this is your process dictionary as well because you are going to use this to number one plan your project you are going to use this dictionary to visualize your process if you are doing that or if you are simply testing then you this is going to help you with that now since you have two 300 process this could be very overwhelming for some people that how are you going to validate how are you going to understand all of these requirements and what you are going to be evaluating during the demos and typically your demos are going to be two four maybe eight hours not more than that because vendors will not be willing to commit as much time during your demo so you need to sort of limit in terms of what is going to be a real critical success factor for you and typically you are looking at all of the critical success factors that are going to be make or break for your implementation. So that's how you are going to identify the critical success factors. If you have more than 10 critical success factors, typically that's too much because you will not be able to review as many of them during your demo. And it's very likely that the vendors are going to show you things where either they are too generic or they are really strong at that. And then they are going to brush off the other ones just because they are going to say that, you know what, I have run out of time and you are probably not going to feel that they have missed on something and that might mislead the decision. So overall, from the critical success factor perspective, you really need to be super focused in terms of what is going to be super critical for you. So you cannot focus on the nice to have requirements. These are going to be super, super, super critical make or break for your implementation. And that's what is going to 
help you be focused with your selection process as well. Otherwise, all of the ERP systems are going to appear very, very, very similar. And that is the problem that a lot of people face when they are looking at these ERP systems. Other than that, you also need to capture some sort of priority in terms of how it is going to be developed. And then you are also looking at the system boundaries. If you don't have the system boundaries, which process is going to be hosted where? If you're simply looking at this more from the ERP perspective, then sometimes you are going to over host these processes inside the ERP system and that could fire back as well because the experience is not going to be as optimum. People are most likely not going to use the ERP system. So that's why it is very important to number one, recognize, okay, how many systems are we replacing in the architecture? Which is going to be our new architecture? What are going to be the process boundaries? Who is going to host what? Because there is going to be substantial overlapping boundaries across the system types, whether you are looking at just the ERP, WMS, TMS, e-commerce, whatever you have in your architecture. There are going to be significant overlaps. Even if you are getting these systems from the same vendor, they also have substantial amount of overlaps. And that's where your architecture and the process boundaries are going to be super critical. So make sure you analyze that. So that's the requirement metrics. And that's number three. Now, number four on our list is business process re-engineering maps. So even if you are going to follow the SMART criteria in the previous step, uh, you are going to get the process dictionary, but your users sort of don't know what they are committing to because they cannot forecast how these decisions are going to impact their life unless they are implementing ERP systems on a daily basis. So they are going to be in a state where they need to confirm because obviously you have made them accountable, but as such, they are going to struggle to visualize whether they are making the right decisions or not. For the most part, when you are going to work uh, with the technical vendors such as your OEM or resellers, their hope is going to be that you need to make decisions. They are not going to make decisions for you. And again, these decisions is what drive whether you are going to get results from your ERP systems or not. So that's where your process maps can help. Number one, it helps develop the language with the users that you are developing the, the a language that they can easily follow along, easily understand. And so when you are going to design these as is maps, they can see, okay, now this is my as is view and I am comparing this with my to be view and I can see how my workflow is going to change. And that's number four. <music> Now, number five is the data re-engineering maps uh, as well as reconciliation workflows. And data re-engineering is probably going to be one of the most critical step of your ERP implementation if you want this to be successful. And the reason for that is most of the time when you are looking at your data, that is going to be in a state, if you are going to dump it as is, most likely you are going to have issues because typically data drives the processes and processes drive the system. So data is going to be the underlying variable that need to be changed first before you can fix the process. So what you are looking at from the data perspective, number one, your stakeholders need to visualize, understand, why the data need to be changed. And even if you are coming from the ERP from the same vendor to a different solution from the same vendor, even then you might have to do substantial data re-engineering, depending upon how your system was implemented, how it was configured, how you are tracking different hierarchies inside your data. So when you look at the data re-engineering, that is going to paint the picture in terms of why the data changes are necessary and why these codings are going to be necessary, the hierarchies, the business rules that you are going to set up inside your ERP. And that's when you are are going to provide the understanding to your business users, you know, how their life is going to change. So when they are going to look at, okay, this is my changed maps for data, and this is my changed map for processes. These are the changes that we are going to make in terms of data. Some of the examples from the data re-engineering could be that, okay, you implemented an ERP somehow, the previous ERP was not as sophisticated as the new one that you are getting. And in that, the way you had configured your customer master, you simply took a shortcut and you had, let's say, the parent account that you were supposed to capture at the customer master level. But somehow you figured that, you know what, that's not going to work for us. You know, we have unique requirements. So I am going to create a category at the heart master level just to get the analytics and the reporting that I'm looking for. 
Now, this is going to convolute the whole data structure because you have created a data structure that was not necessary. You did it just because you didn't understand the capabilities of the previous system. Now, if you take that data as is to the new system, you are going to have substantial issues. So that's where the data re-engineering is going to be super handy. If you look at the data the way it is structured as of today, does it need to be restructured for the new system to be efficient, to be able to work? So that's what is data re-engineering. And the reconciliation workflows are super handy as well. Because if you're simply looking at the lenses of ERP for these systems, then what is going to happen is even if you simplify everything from the ERP perspective, you might complicate things from the other system perspective, and then you are going to get far more variances or reconciliation effort, and that is going to drive your admin effort. So even if you are getting a new technology, your overall admin effort or the operational effort may be more. So what you need to do is you need to analyze the reconciliation workflows across the architecture whatever decisions you are making you should not be over complicating the reconciliation just because you are simplifying some decisions for the sales team just because they are adamant about you know how they want to capture their data but once you capture the reconciliation workflows then everybody sort of can see that okay since we are simplifying that the impact of that is going to be on the downstream system, downstream processes, downstream department, and they are going to struggle a lot because now we are probably hiring 20 accountants just to reconcile for the decision that we have made in the front end process. And that's where the data re-engineering is super, super, super handy. So that's number five. Now, number six uh, on our list is the organizational change management deliverables. So for the organizational change management deliverables, you have many different deliverables that are going to be part of organization change management. By the way, if you have not checked uh, our article uh, related to organizational change management deliverable, we are going to include the link. So make sure you guys uh, check that out because there are going to be at least five to 10 different uh, deliverables that are part of change management because each of the change could have its own life cycle, could have its own deliverable, could be a project in itself. So you need to make sure that you are tracking each of the change item and you have the documentation around that. Uh, sometimes that could impact your scheduling, costing, budgeting. That could also impact decisions, whether that's the changes that you're going to have, if customers are going to be okay with that. For example, let's say if you invest in the implementation, you invest in the selection with the assumption that you are going to make changes in your SKU scheme or going to make changes in the way you are printing your labels at this point of time. But let's say if the customers or vendors do not agree with that assumption, then you will have to make changes. And sometimes those changes could be millions and millions of dollars. So that's why analyzing the change management items in isolation is super critical. Make sure you check with every stakeholder that is going to be impacted with the change item that you have. And that's number six. <music> Now, number seven on our list is transformation roadmap as well as business case. So when you look at transformation roadmap, this is going to be the roadmap that you are building depending upon how many different solutions that you have identified and you are building a business case for each of those solutions. Sometimes you might have two or three different strategies that you want to take, but you need to analyze the cost. You need to analyze the time. You need to analyze the effort. And all of that is going to be done as part of your transformation roadmap. Sometimes you might have just one version. Sometimes you might have multiple versions. But this step is going to help you in how you are going to sort of plan the whole project, what is going to be the cost. The cost is going to be including everything that you are doing. That could be whether you are doing any sort of integration or you are simply selecting an ERP and how many ever different systems that you are going to have. You need to analyze the cost of that, but then you are also going to have cost of if you are changing any sort of processes, how are you going to implement those? If you are changing any sort of data, how are you going to implement those? And then you have to have the rollout strategy as well. Sometimes the rollout strategy could be multi years, depending upon how, how much you can change right away, how much friction that is going to cause with the business model as well as from the processes perspective. So you need to analyze all of that and you need to create the, the roadmap. So that's number seven. Number eight is the enterprise architecture as well as master data governance plan. And most ERP selection consulting firms, they are probably going to think that 
enterprise architecture as well as master data governance is probably going to be during your implementation phase. But if you do this in the implementation phase, then you are living by the constraint of the system that you have selected and sometimes that could fire back. So that's why the enterprise architecture and master data governance plan, you need to discuss this in the selection phase and you need to build how uh, different processes are going to be interacting with each other, how diff different systems are going to be interacting with each other, how different departments are going to be using different systems, how different users are going to be using different systems, what is going to be their verification path, what is going to be their reconciliation path. So if they are going to use one system, what is the responsibility of that system? So you need to design all of these integration flows, workflows from the system perspective. So this is a very system centric view that you are designing as part of the enterprise architecture, depending upon whatever you are keeping in your architecture and whatever you are replacing. But master data governance journeys you need to design across the systems as well, because if you don't do that, you are going to find a lot of surprises. If you do this, then your teams are going to be aligned with respect to decisions, why you are posting certain processes inside ERP, just because they can see that if you don't centralize, you are going to have a lot of issues with your architecture, with your master data, with your data quality. So that's why building master data governance plan as well as enterprise architecture as part of your selection process is super critical. And that's number eight. Number nine on our list is the solution matrix. It's going to be vendor RFP and demo scripts. So now once you have done all of that, then you are going to be in a position where uh, you have already identified those critical success factors. Now, based on those critical success factors, you are rating every single solution that you want to consider. There could be 10, 15, 20, 40, 200, whatever number that may be, but you are looking at, okay, can I identify, let's say three or four systems based on the critical success factor. So that's going to be your first cut or the short list that you are taking with the vendors because you are going to have only so much time to dig into each of those solutions. So you are creating an initial list based on that analysis. So that's where your solution matrix is going to be handy. Once you have all of that, then you are going to write an RFP. And with RFP, there is a little art in terms of how you need to write because if you are going to be too tight or too verbose, or if you're looking for things that vendors feel that they are going to waste time with the deal, then most likely they are not going to be excited. They might not even engage with you just because they might feel that, you know what, I am not going to get selected. I'm not going to waste time in this deal because in most cases, this could be very expensive for the vendors as well, because the selection process or the sales process is a, a sunk cost for them as well when they are looking at these deals. And if they don't win, they don't make any money. So that's a huge problem. And that's why what you need to do is when you look at these RFP, be super focused. Focus only on critical success factors that are going to be make or break for your implementation. That's going to drive your demos well, because you should be looking at only those factors. If you are going to be looking at simpler scenarios, such as how do you process a sales order in every single system? Sure, every single vendor is going to show the navigation, but for the most part, there is no differentiator as such when you look at how do you process sales order. So that's where you need to really pay attention to the critical success factors. That is going to be the data model related, the way data model is designed, because that typically drives everything from what traceability you are going to get, what results you are going to get, and whether your system is going to work for your use cases or not. So that's where you need to be super strategic about how you are going to write the RFP. Now, demo scripts are very important as well because they are going to provide the structure for the demo. Otherwise, the vendors are going to invest time in the unnecessary details and you might not get the answers that you are looking for. So that's why setting expectations in terms of what you are looking for and what you are expecting with each of the demos can sort of set the expectations with each of the party and then they are not going to waste your time and you are not going to waste their time. And that's why writing demo scripts in a manner where you are really hitting on those critical success factors is super, super, super critical. So that's number nine. Now, number 10 on our list is contract analysis and the vendor scorecards. So when you have your solution matrix, that is going to be some sort of hypothesis. But as you go through the written responses of the RFP 
as you are going through the demos, then you are going to be revising the solution matrix as well as you are creating the vendor scorecard that you can easily communicate to your team because you need to build the consensus in terms of which solution you want to go for. In most cases, you want to have some sort of framework that you want to utilize so that everybody feels comfortable with the solution and they own the solution. If they are not going to own from the selection phase itself, then obviously you are going to have uh, adoption issues. The other things that is going to be part of this uh, ERP selection deliverable is going to be the contract analysis that also you need to have. Sometimes you are going to have contract clauses such as the licensing, the way the licensing is going to be, that could drive a lot of different things. Initially, you might get a discount, but then if you did not understand how the excess is going to work, you might get a change order, which might suck up all the discounts that you have um, utilized with the vendor. And that's why you need to be super careful with every single clause that you have in the contract. And you need to hire experts who are seeing these contracts on a daily basis. But even for them, sometimes it will be hard because vendors are changing their pricing. They are changing their contracts on a daily basis. So you definitely require some sort of expertise to analyze these contracts. If you don't get that, then you might be in trouble because sometimes you are investing hundreds and thousands of dollars or millions of dollars with these uh, systems. And if they don't work, to your expectation, there might be real challenges from the finance perspective as well as from the implementation perspective. So that's it for this list. If you enjoyed this list, it is also available in the audio form on Apple, Google, Spotify in terms of the audio podcast. So make sure you check that out. Also, if you have not subscribed to our YouTube channel, we publish these videos on a weekly basis. So you don't want to miss that out. If you have not checked our digital transformation report, we are going to include the link. So check that out. Also, we are going to include the link of a detailed article, which is going to have far deeper analysis. So you might want to check that too. On that note, thanks everyone for tuning in. I'll see you in the next one.